All right. Hello, everybody. This is Connor Lestoka, and you are listening to 372 Pages We'll Never Get Back. Uh, this is a podcast book club about a book that we're pretty sure we're going to hate. And joining me on this adventure is my friend and Riff Tracks colleague, Mike Nelson. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Well, I guess that's the tension. Are we going to hate it? Well, that's stay tuned. A real question. I, I, I am willing and would be thrilled if we did not hate it. I just don't know, based on what I've seen so far, if that's going to happen. Before we reveal the title, because obviously you clicked on this without reading anything about it, <laughs> um, can, I, uh, can I just point out that and this person shall remain anonymous for the, for the sake of this story, is that Connor and I were in the presence of another friend of ours talking about our plans to do this, and that person said, oh, I love that book. So look, <laughs> look, who knows? Maybe we will love this book. But now that we've set that tension up, Connor, what is the book? So the book, Mike, is going to be Ready Player One, and it is a best-selling, like all-time best-selling novel by Ernest Klein. Um, it came out in August 6th of 2011, and it has since amassed uh, 13,000 Amazon reviews. It is currently eighth on their most read charts, along with books like Game of Thrones and the Harry Potter books, which people are still just devouring, evidently. Still? Yes. And this guy's it's, book is from 2011, and it's still... I think it's safe to say that this guy could buy and sell us. He could murder us in the middle of Times Square and get away with it. He's richer than He could than offer priests. us $500 to stop doing this podcast tomorrow, and we would obviously <laughs> accept that. <laughs> right. Because it's also going to be a best-selling... I mean, a hit movie directed by Steven Spielberg that's coming out in March... And they debuted the trailer for that at Comic-Con, which got people talking about it more. And that is sort of how it came to my attention. A, a passage circulated online. A Twitter user named Donnie Mnemonic posted a screenshot of a, of a block of text. <laughs> yes. Don, he posted a screenshot of a block of text from this book that sort of was notorious, I guess. And it made the rounds. And it was a, it was essentially just a list of shit from the 80s that this author likes. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, is it fair to say that it was, um, you either had a strong positive reaction or a strong negative reaction just to this one passage from the book? And that's what piqued your interest, uh, I believe. Yes, I and like Donnie Mnemonic and many people who retweeted that thousands of times had a very negative reaction to it. Um, but like our friend said, and 91% uh, of Amazon reviews have given it four and five stars, a lot of people had a positive reaction to it. So I think that by sort of reading it with you, talking it through, having people read along with this, we can maybe find out who these people are that like it, because so far that one person is the only person that we've met who has come out and admitted it. And we can find out... Um, who doesn't like it and maybe how something that people are so vocally uh, dis disdainful for becomes such a phenomenon. Yeah, I like the idea of something that, uh, look, I'm, you know, at my age, I'm, I think I'm 52. I sometimes I forget. Uh, there are entire pop phenomenon that you lose track of. Now, young people, you will find this amazing, but it actually happens that uh, certain songs or artists will go, will just pass you by as you live your life. This is one of those. And I like exploring these big giant pop phenomenons of, about which I am utterly ignorant. And so I am willing to be persuaded by this book. How about you? Are you, are, are you going in headstrong like, I will hate it? I mean, I know that's the title of our podcast. Right, yeah. But look, that's where we're not, you know, our cards are on the table. We will probably hate it. However, I'm open to it. Oh, I'm open to it too. And I was actually very surprised when I went looking for the sort of information about it because it does this book does have positive reviews on amazon and based on everything that i saw on twitter and people sort of making fun of it that that came as a surprise to me um but people 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 evidently like it and i would be more than happy if we spent the next couple of weeks uh reading a book that i enjoyed as opposed to one that i uh, was not a fan of because um well we'll get to this in a minute but we don't read many books and it would be nice to to sort of enjoy one that you were reading. Yeah, yeah, we're doing this on the basis of, like, it's it's, it's not like we're doing a, uh, a podcast about being flogged. Hey, maybe we'll like it, you know, who knows? <laughs> right. No, this, this uh, despite our cynical title, we're, we're actually, enter, uh, we're entertaining the idea that we will be entertained by this. That's our tagline, by the way, I just wrote it. 
it's, it's not going to be 52 weeks of, of lutefisk, nothing but lutefisk, right. where we're like, you know, it's going to be the worst year of my life. I'm eating nothing but this horrible jellied fish. Um, right. But what we know about it now is um, mostly through reviews, right? Yes. And uh, don't you, you have a little collection of reviews there, I believe. Yeah. So in the, in the, in the edition of the book that we're using, which has a sort of orangish cover, um, it is has starts off with a bunch of blurbs from critics about it. And I just went through and highlighted some of the the most interesting blurbs there. So the, right off the bat, I want to ask you, there are 20 blurbs at the start of this book. And what is your over under on how many times the word geek <laughs> shows up in those blurbs? Oh, dear Lord, I hope it's 25. But I, I doubt it's I, I'm you know, I don't know. I'm going to say 12. OK, the answer is nine. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much 50% of these have the word geek. Actually, that's slightly weighted because the very first blurb in the book is from USA Today, and it is three sentences, and it involves the word geek three times. <laughs> yes. So the mission the mission statement is very clear here. It, <laughs> it is seeing the crowded wave of geek culture uh, cresting, and it is saying us too. Please let us let us ride this wave. Yes. So let me let me read that sentence. It's, it says it's geeky characters are geeky cool. Its action is imaginative, always cinematic, and you don't have to be a geek to get it. Wow. Imagine if this were the 60s and the word groovy were just sort of like becoming nauseating to everyone. Oh, my God. And then it was just like, it's a groovy book with groovalicious people. <laughs> that is I mean, exactly is what, what it's going it's to be like. like in 30 years. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, so USA Today, not embarrassed about just going balls to the wall on this uh, the press release and just taking it and running with it. Pretty much, exactly. The, the agent was like, really, really hammer home that geek thing. But that is not the worst, because the next one uh, uses the word nerdgasm, which uh. may, be the, it may be the first time that word has ever appeared in the New York Times. Wow. Uh, the paper of record, nerdgasm. <laughs> Okay. And it says, uh, it says, Mr. Klein is able to incorporate his favorite toys and games into a perfectly accessible narrative. <laughs> He's that, able, is he? Wow. It's, it's really the goal of any, of any fiction writer, I think, of any great novelist to, you know, when Tolstoy sat down and uh, was going to do War and Peace, he was like, this is good. I just really wish I had been able to incorporate more of my favorite toys and games into this, into this novel of mine. Right. Uh, you know, Turgenev sat down and saw the Matryoshka dolls. He's just like, I'm just going to look around my room. What is around? Oh, hey, there's some dolls that I like. Yeah, you, he, he obviously just, uh, uh, he sat down at a computer with the things that were in his head and brought nothing else to it. But hey, I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe that's, that's not true. Like it's like, you know, you go to your, your, your parent-teacher conference, and they're like, Timmy is a very gifted kindergartner. He tells these stories. He incorporates his favorite toys and games into them. <laughs> like, he was playing with the blocks, and he, he introduced them to the matchbox cars. And then the teacher gets ahead of herself, or himself. Hey, I caught myself there. And says, um, <laughs> maybe Timmy will write a great novel someday. You know, and his parents, yeah, they look at each other and they 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 think, oh, and then Timmy becomes a uh, a, a banker. <laughs> yes. um, another one calls it the Huffington Post calls it a grown ups Harry Potter, which is a very interesting descriptor because hmm. every single adult that I have met has read every single Harry Potter. It is not a uh, a, a strange thing for a grown up to have read Harry Potter. Yeah, that's a puzzling description from a book that sold eighty five trillion copies. Assume there were a lot of adults in there. Yes. Uh, and then another one that I really enjoyed was this one. This one is from the Sacramento News and Review. It says, uh, if you identify yourself as a nerd, geek, gamer, 80s history buff. So there's going to be some history in here, Mike. This is not just going to be a, a list of pop culture. They're going to get into the uh, hostage crisis, I assume. Iran-Contra. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, they'll have a lot of talk about Walter Mondale. <laughs> Uh, a fan of science, fantasy, or dystopian fiction, otaku. Do you know what an otaku is? Otaku. I think I was in uh, Trader Joe's. I believe that's a new almond flavor, like a spicy <laughs> almond that they have right at the counter. They're trying to push it. I believe that an otaku is essentially a Japanese nerd. And the sort of okay. origin of the word was that this was someone who was so obsessed with their hobbies, be it uh, gaming or anime, that 
they would stay inside the essential, essentially a basement dweller. They would stay inside and pursue this hobby to the extent of their social life. Oh, so so unlike the uh, sporty nerds and geeks who are always out uh, running marathons and sprinting and playing baseball games that we have in our country. Yes, they were not uh, the type of geeks that are out toasting with cigars and telling ribald tales and slapping <laughs> the table. Right. So then it keeps going, and this is my favorite one. It says, uh, so dystopian fiction, otaku, 1980s movie fan. And that, again, is... You know, just like the history buff, I, they say that if you're a 1980s movie fan, you're going to get this. But I don't think this is going to be delving into ordinary people or the last emperor. It is talking about a very specific subset of 1980s movies, which are, you know, the geek movies of record. Sure. They're going to be doing like, uh, you know, my favorite movie, uh, Local Hero, uh, yes. stuff like that, gonna... like the quirky independent films, I assume. Right. Yes. There's going to be lots of local hero references. They're going to be uh, talking about the uh, uncle from Field of Dreams who causes the girl to choke on the hot dog. That's a very, <laughs> very common geek reference. So, uh, But yeah, it's going to be Indiana Jones. It's going to be Back to the Future. It's going to be Kremlins. It's going to be John Hughes movies, that sort of thing. Um, if I could back up, I will give you all the money in my pocket if you can name the actor who played the uncle who watched the girl choking on the hot dog in Field of Dreams. It's it's the guy from Thirty Something, which is a reference that I should not have in my in my holster. And I want to say, I'll give you half credit for even coming up with that. That's great. Yeah, I want to say his name's Jeffrey. <laughs> that sounds like you just uh, saw uh, someone's uh, phone number on your phone and came up with it. No, his name is Timothy Busfield. Ah, uh, all right, that wasn't something. No, that wasn't something that I had in my... He, he, if you look him up, he has a notorious Minneapolis incident that, about oh. which I will say no more, but you can look it up online. Over um, the top of lemon chiffon, I think? Uh, it's <laughs> a little less whimsical than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, his, 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 his place in Field of Dreams is grabbing his, do his niece and shaking her to the point where he knocks her off of bleachers. So, hey, all not... is forgiven one minute later, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so that's the, yeah, those are the blurbs. It keeps going, it keeps listing geeky things that you're going to love about them. But yeah, people bought, people bought fully into this. What, one more, one more I want to read. Uh, it's a guy from boingboing.com, a notable geek, sort of probably a founding geek website. But a guy says, the best science fiction novel I've read in a decade. I loved every sentence. Good Lord. So, wow. So keep that in mind as we're, as we're, as we're flipping through. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll just we'll find some sentences that we'll, we'll we'll parse out whether that was the one that he really loved as we, as we go through this. We may quibble with him on a <laughs> sentence or two, but yes. we, we shall see. Who knows? Um, all right. So that's that's essentially what I've got so far. And but like we said earlier, the, a, a book is a major commitment. And we're asking people to come along on this on this ride with us because a book is not something that you just sit down and, and watch an hour and a half of and then you've experienced it. It's going to be something that takes a long time. And I don't know about you, but I don't read, I'm not dashing off a book a week. No, I'm not. I, um, I read very slowly. Um, but, uh, you know, I read a lot of books at the same time, meaning like four pages and then I fall asleep or then I read on a plane. So yeah, it is a commitment. And this is a, you know, it's a medium sized novel, I guess it's not, uh, you know, it's not a Russian novel. It's not a novella. It's somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but so I thought it would be fun to sort of go through some of the books that we're not reading at the expense of Ready Player One, just to sort of, um, you know, see what we what we could be experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I think that fits in with the the concept and title of uh, Pages We'll Never Get Back. So this is right. the things we could have been doing instead. All right, I'm, I'm getting so I, I I found a list of the best books of the 20th century, and this is according to a site called Modern Library, which you know, no one has ever heard of, but it's evidently part of Random House. So they did a survey of all the people that work there and probably journalists to determine the best books of the 20th century. So let's just run down these and tick off how many of these great books that we have not read uh, that we will read Ready Player One before we ever tackle. Okay. I love exposing my ignorance to others. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so number one is Ulysses by James Joyce. Absolutely not. Yeah, that's not a question. That's that's sort of just them, you know, putting that up there. That book exists so that it can be the top of a list of a book of books that people have not read. 
Absolutely. Uh, that and uh, what's the uh, uh, Thomas Pinchon novel? Um, sure. Uh, I, I, I only, haven't read it. <laughs> I know one person who claims to have read it and love it, and it's my lifelong goal to get them to admit that that is not true. I, they they right. keep up the pretense. They're like, no, it's great. You should read. And I, I just, I don't buy it. So th- this is the uh, the older version of that, yeah. That would be a great bluff for, for you to call him on. It would be a, a very serious commitment in calling bluff to read a thousand pages of Gravity's Rainbow <laughs> in order to humiliate this person and catch him in a long con that he thought he would never, ever be... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just at chapter 36, you know, this this part, and then just go into great... T- remember? Like, just yeah, like just make a, a completely different uh, plot for it and get them in... Tr- <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that now that you mention that. Um, so then, uh, it, but yeah, Ulysses at the top of this is like if just every movie list was topped by like the Decalogue or something like that, just a a, a, a long slog of something that no one would ever consider actually sitting down to watch. Yeah, like... Showa or something being the right. number one, which, which by the way, I have seen. I saw it over a course of like 10 days because it was available on Netflix or something. And, you know, so, but it's not a movie that you sit down and watch in the theater or <laughs> right. something. I got to take a break. My sides are hurting from laughing. It's uh, it just, <laughs> all right. So number two is one that I, I bet my money would be that we both read, The Great Gatsby. Yes. Yeah. I've read it within the last two years. Yeah. I have read it since high school, which is when, a lot of these books are probably going to be coming up, but I read it after high school on my own and, and enjoyed it. Uh, the next one, however, is A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, also by James Joyce. Uh, I, I, I have not read that. Uh, I think I started it and, and tossed it away. But once I got into my 30s, I was like, life is too short to even read the books that you're supposed to read. But if they're boring you, like there's another one out there. And, you exactly. Know, so that was one of those. I'm sorry to say. So, so yeah, books. I mean, I've, I've, I've put down books that I have gotten into and realized were not for me. And I don't feel bad about doing that. I'm not someone who plods along with this. So the fact that we're committing to this ready player one is a, is a, is a, is a decent commitment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and we're all past the stage of, uh, have you ever done that where I think when I was younger, people would say, have you read this? And sometimes you would say yes when you hadn't, but then when you're a little more mature, you go, Oh no, but I want to, which is like a weird thing. Like, who cares when you want to? I'm just right, asking, exactly. did you read it? Like, everybody wants to read, you know, The Four Musketeers or whatever. Like, I, but did you? I'm just asking. So now, just, now I'm he, old enough to just go, I don't know. I didn't read that. I'm fine with that. And I imagine that when someone does that uh, with a book, it's not the same as, you know, hey, have you seen the new Transformers, which I've, I've done before? And then they, you say no, and then they still insist on sort of describing to you things that happen in it, which is one of the most puzzling phenomena. like, I haven't seen it. That means that I have not expressed an interest in seeing it. And yet here you are talking to me about specific things in it as if I have, you know, uh, agreed that I have seen it and want to see it. So, yeah, people do that with, uh, with ads with me, which drives me crazy. Have you seen that ad where that guy comes out? It's like, no, I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's, oh man. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you are not going to spend time describing an ad to me. I refuse. <laughs> Uh, so let's just do these next uh, six quick. We have okay. Lolita. Uh, I have read that. Okay, I have not. Uh, next one is Brave New World. Uh, high school, forced to, don't remember, don't care. Okay, that, that that strikes me as being sort of high for for not having read it. That doesn't sound, um, it probably just has important ideas in it, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the uh, the other version of 1984, right? It's kind of the a different dystopian thing. Yeah, R- roughly in the same group, right? Uh, the Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Uh, started it as a pretentious high schooler. Uh, never <laughs> finished it. Carried it around with me and hoped that teachers would notice. <laughs> what do you think the ultimate book for the pretentious high school to carry around with them is? Uh, uh, to my shame, I once had a hard copy version of. Uh, have you heard of Saul Bellow? He was kind of. Uh, uh, I think he won I have, Pulitzer a couple times. Um, and I've heard of him because I believe he's mentioned on either Simpsons or Seinfeld. Okay. <laughs> uh, I carried around a large hardcover uh, as a, like a 15-year-old to a class with a teacher that I wanted to impress. A Humboldt's gift. It was, And it's, I'm sure, unreadable to anyone under the age of 50 or something. And I carried wow. it around to my shame. 
And the teacher knew, of course, and like came up and tapped it and was like, you really, uh, you like this? You dig into this? <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to start tomorrow. Uh, I think that there's, there's a couple answers. I think that on the road is probably a good one um, like that. Um, Art of War is a popular one. Oh, yes. I see guys carrying that around on airplanes. We get, but it. The, we get it, dude. The main answer is uh, I've read it. I enjoyed it. And yet still when I would see someone at a coffee shop like thud infinite jest down onto the table, it was always just a little <laughs> bit uh, yeah, performative, it seemed like. Exactly. That's a perfect one. All right. So the next uh, four, Catch-22. Have not. Read other okay. stuff by him, but not that. I have read a few pages of it. We tried to start another book club. Wasn't into it for whatever reason. Uh, that was the last time I tried to do a book club, though. So didn't even finish it for that one. Uh, Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kessler. Have not read it. Have not heard of it. I have not heard of it. I've not heard of that book or him. That is impressive. And he is in the top 10. Top 10 books for the 20th century. <laughs> I don't think... I think if you looked at a list of the 100 best movies, like that AFA list, you would have heard of at least every single movie on there. It's crazy to uh, not know one of the top 10 books. Yeah, well, I mean, their number one is a book that no one's ever right. read, so exactly. I guess it makes sense. <laughs> uh, then we go to Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence, which I have not. I have not read any D.H. Lawrence, I admit it. And then Grapes of Wrath. I have read that. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm batting a solid... Point one on that list. <laughs> I would be below the Mendoza line. So uh, that and the works of Shakespeare, you're eschewing to read Ready Player. Ready Player One. Wrong. And just for fun, uh, whenever they did this uh, modern library random house list, they, they let the readers chime in. They didn't just uh, let those elites determine what the best book of the 20th century was. The readers got to say. Oh, and I'm what? assuming it'll be right down the line the same, with maybe yeah, a few they, places jogging. They, they, they rearranged Kessler and uh, Sound in the Fury, <laughs> but no, that is not. It, it is every single book is different. So I'm going to let you try to guess the first one, but I will uh, give you the hint that the number one and two spots are occupied by the same author. Uh I don't know, Tolkien. Tolkien is on the list at number four. The Lord of the Rings is number four. Um, I will let you know another hint. This author, she has four books in the top ten. Oh, well, uh, 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 Harry Potter. Uh, what's her name? Uh, <laughs> I can't think of her uh, name. No, J.K. Rowling. Rowling. Yeah. It is not her. And maybe just as one more hint, uh, I am pretty sure that this, I mean, it must have. This must have been an internet poll. Okay. <laughs> I, right. I'm stumped. Let's just come out. The number one spot, Atlas Shrugged. Number two spot, The Fountainhead. <laughs> of course. And Ayn Rand has the number seven and number eight spots with Anthem and We Are the Living. Um, I read, uh, I confess I read Anthem, which is very, <laughs> very short. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I did read that. Uh, I think I've not read anything, but so maybe, maybe embedded in those books is something that says, you know, a founding tenant of objectivism is go rig online polls uh, <laughs> yeah. in order to get out. <laughs> if necessary, change your IP address and vote again. Yeah. Yes. But then, so, L. Ron Hubbard takes up three other spots on this list. Oh, with come Battle on. Earth, and then Mission Earth, which I assume is a sequel, and then Fear. So, yeah, uh, the lists are slightly different. Wow. All right. Readers and critics not agreeing for once. But that's, So that's a good testament between the um, what we may encounter with this is that you might find uh, people who are passionate about something, and they might be passionate not necessarily in a positive way. So I think that Ready Player One fans or... Uh, Ready Player One haters might be uh, just as vocal as these Ayn Rand fans. Yeah, and that's what we're hoping as we read through this. And I, uh, I guess we hope that you join us uh, on this journey. And again, ready to be persuaded, ready to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, so I think that uh, we should tell people, give them sort of an assignment, as it were. And uh, the first three chapters of the book are about 40 pages. That includes an introduction. So it's, I guess it's sort of four chapters. But if you want to get your own copy and read to the end of the third chapter, that'll be what we discuss in the next episode. And if you want to send us some either suggestions or your thoughts uh, about those first three chapters, we've got uh, presences in all the usual places. Uh, Mike and I are on Twitter, and we have a 372 pages Twitter and Facebook account. 
uh, at 372 pages for both of those. And we've got 372 pages at gmail.com. So send us your thoughts as we um, approach that first episode. I guess this is episode zero, in which we just have laid out our mission. And the first one will be sometime in the next uh, couple days. Yeah. And uh, hey, people, how many podcasts give you a reading assignment? You know, this is a good thing. Get out there, yeah. read, join with us. Uh, I think it'll be, our, be a lot of fun. That'll be our third tagline. Uh, no Casper mattress ads, only reading lists. <laughs> we will uh, we'll let you read less if we can do a, uh, a Lisa mattress ad uh, at oh, some man. point. Yeah. Oh, that's the, that's the sweet stuff. Yeah, that's where we're really no. If, if you start hearing those ads, you'll know we made it, baby. If we have to master the cadence of voice of reading an ad that lets the listener know when they can stop fast forwarding through it, because there's always a difference. You can always tell um, when someone's reading it as opposed to doing the actual good part of the podcast. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we promise at some point to get into those uh, uh, free meal, you know, those food things where you prepare your meal at home <laughs> and pretend like we've actually eaten them. And then, uh, <laughs> then we'll know we've made it. Perfect. Um, all right. So I think that uh, that about does it for this first one. And yeah, please follow us along. And we hope you will take this journey with us as we, we read a book that we're pretty sure we're going to hate. It is going to be a ton of fun. Connor, I look forward to it. Thank you for, uh, what do you call it, dragooning me, shanghaiing me into this yeah, podcast? Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> Shanghai. We're, you're, you're setting sail to the new world with me. I love it. All right. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time. See you next time.